We are proud to announce the 2019 Palisade Global Hard Asset Conference, taking place on Jackal Island from May 16th to May 20th. Speakers confirmed include one of the most successful venture capital fund managers within the resource space, Marin Katusa. Legendary mining investor Paul Matizek, former hedge fund manager Mike Alkin, and CEO at US Global Investors, Frank Holmes. All these guests, plus many more to be announced. Sign up now for more details and to be included in our special guest list. Join us in Jackal Island. Become part of a growing number of investors who are ready to take advantage of the coming resource boom. Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. I'm your guest host, Karema Mutlu. And on today's show, we have John Hathaway, Portfolio Manager for the Tocqueville Gold Fund. How are you today, John? I'm good, thanks. How are you doing? I'm very good, thank you. Let's begin with the recent M&A activity within the major mining equities, namely Newmont acquiring Gold Corp. What's your take on this? Will this kind of activity for the mining sector continue? And does it signal a change in how major mid-tier producers will operate their businesses going forward? Well, the sector is consolidating. Um, we've seen, uh, obviously, a big deal between Rand Gold and Barrick, and now the new Newmont Gold Corp. Um, that takes out basically two of the very large cap names in the space. So um, I, I'm not sure you could say that there were a lot of synergies in the Newmont Gold Corp deal. I think what you will see is rationalization of the uh, existing portfolio of mines for both companies, <clears throat> probably uh, some cost savings. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, I, I think the, the guy that really had it right was Sam Zell, who said, when you see this kind of activity, there's not a whole lot of money being put into the ground for uh, new mining projects. Um, and I think that's true. So uh, the implication I would draw is that um, the industry at large is running out of reserves. The pipeline, pipeline of new projects is in jeopardy. So, you know, maybe we'll see one or two more blockbuster type deals like uh, Newmont Gold Corp and Barrick uh, Rand Gold. But I think more likely you're going to see a lot of takeovers of intermediate, intermediate and smaller cap companies uh, to replenish the pipeline. Um, so I think that's what I would take from it. I, I don't think uh, you know there are any major implications in terms of a change in how the industry is going to be managed um, um, other than that. They're running out of reserves, and um, I believe there are going to be a lot more takeovers to come. So, John, are we in a bottoming phase for gold at around the $1,200 area? What do your years of experience tell you about where we currently are for gold and the underlying equities? Investors appear to be waiting for a break above $1,300 and for that to hold before believing a real move will occur for gold. Right. There's a huge amount of apathy uh, um, at large. Um, and, you know, I guess 1300 is sort of the magic number um, that would maybe excite some interest. Um, I would take a step back and say what would drive it. And there are any number of things you could talk about, but the most uh, tangible, easily identifiable catalyst is the U.S. fiscal situation, which is uh, where I believe the U.S. is in the top 10 um, countries in the world in terms of the highest debt to GDP ratio. And I think a lot of people sort of know that, but the implications I think are, are haven't been thought through. The, um, the, we're, we're at a stage now where, um, the debt is growing faster than the economy. Um, I saw a Gunlack, Jeff Gunlack say the other day, that he thinks the debt 
public debt is growing at 6%, I would have said 5% for the next five years. And that basically assumes no recession uh, or anything bad happening. Um, the economy, I don't think there's an economist alive that would that would argue that the GDP in real terms can grow that fast. So the outlook is for um, a higher debt to GDP ratio. And over history, throughout history, a ratio at that level has meant currency collapse. Um, so it's a question of when this becomes front and center in terms of what's on investors' minds. Um, but there are some telltale signs right now that you can look at. Uh, the bid-to-cover ratio at Treasury auctions has been moving steadily lower, which means there's a sign of disinterest um, on the part of investors in buying debt at these levels, at these levels of interest rates. Um, so that's the first telltale sign. Another thing which you can point to is that, uh, and remember that central banks, foreign central banks have been major buyers of the U.S. debt to finance our deficits. Um, the, um, the amount of uh, investment in uh, U.S. treasuries has gone down substantially over the last five years. And instead, foreign central banks have been buying gold. You've seen that in any number of countries, including China, Russia, major trading partners such as that. I guess China would be the big one, India as well. So um, uh, there is, I think, a real risk. And I'm actually, I'll, I will cite another investment luminary here, Ray Dalio, who thinks that we could see a 25 to 30 percent devaluation of the dollar in the next, um, he said, I believe, a uh, couple of years, two or three years. That would be catastrophic for a lot of different things, but it would be terrific for gold. And I kind of think that the, if you're a, a long, weary fellow traveler in the gold space and you wanted one single thing that's very mechanical, very predictable, very easy to understand, to kind of hang your hat on for the investment rationale, it would be um, the arithmetic, basically, of um, a growing debt burden and a slowing economy. So um, long-winded answer, but um, I kind of think that uh, I would not waste a lot of time thinking about 1300 or you know above or beyond above or below by a couple of dollars what i'm looking for is a major breakout from a multi-year consolidation um you could call it even a five-year basing pattern um and in my mind when gold does break out it's not going to be just because it got through 1300 it's going to be because um there's a tremendous amount of um, concern outside of the gold space uh, about the implications of uh, a debt to GDP ratio, a fiscal situation that's out of control. Let's talk about silver and why that could be such an important barometer for gold. Silver tends to lag in the early innings of a move in gold, but once a substantial move takes place, then a catch up tends to occur. What is the price action in silver telling you about today's market? Well, it's, it's trying. It's starting to show some life. Um, I don't pay that much attention to moving averages and that kind of thing. But it is true that silver has been a laggard. Um, in my mind, silver has always been gold on steroids. And um, gold has to lead the way. Um, but um, as I said, once gold does assert itself, um, you're going to see, as you always have seen, a bigger move percentage-wise in silver. Um, again, I don't think silver is going to do anything on its own until you see a gold lead the way. But um, anybody who has invested in this space for 
<clears throat> I guess as long as I have would would know and, and you know basically the message would be um, the high octane way to be in this uh, I guess high octane space is is silver. Excellent. Apart from gold and silver, are there any other commodities that look cheap and attractive to you at the moment? Do you have any thoughts on copper or nickel, for example? Um, I would say generally, and again, this is from 50,000 feet uh, surveillance, um, there has been underinvestment in all of the things you mentioned. Oil, could you could add oil to the list. So I do think you will see a supply and demand uh, response to underinvestment across the board in hard commodities. Um, we may have to go through a recession first, which would only make the potential uh, for an explosive move up in the entire commodity complex to take place. But it's out there, um, and uh, the world needs more of everything you mentioned um, based on population growth, based on economic growth. Um, and and so um, I would just add to that thought, just kind of an across the board um, thumbs up to the idea of investing in hard assets. Very good. So as we wrap up, John, is there anything else you wish to discuss today? Well, I think, again, I would, I would, and what I'm focused on right now is the huge gap in valuation between uh, the senior large cap companies in the precious metal space and the small ones. The ratio um, in terms of discount to NAV um, is the highest it's been in the case of the juniors ever. Um, and in the case of the intermediates to the seniors, it's, uh, I think, at the, at the biggest discount in all but 10% of the time for the last 20 years. So you have tremendous um, apathy, a tremendous dis discount, discounting, and compelling valuation in the entire space, but especially the uh, mid and smaller cap names. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for your time today, John, and we'll have you back on the show again very soon. Okay, thanks, Fred. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bit. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?